You know, I asked them to sing that song this morning because I'm absolutely convinced that it's an anthem for our day. We have seen so much in the last year and a half in our world and it seems to just cycle through on us over and over again. And sometimes we get the sense, even as the people of God, that things are out of control. But they're not because our God reigns and we need to declare it sometimes. Get it out of our mouths. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And my, my spiritual papa, uh, he marked my life in such a special way. Jack Taylor he passed away a couple of months ago. He used to sign every one of his correspondences, his emails, his letters, singing in the rain. R-E-I-G-N. Singing in the singing in the rain. He is today, but so are we. While he so are we, we're singing in his rain. He reigns above it all. You know, when Pastor led us into this series, I was so, so grateful that he did. I know a lot of people get to this part of the Bible called the Minor Prophets, all these funny names up here and, and they just kind of er, er, jump over to Matthew because this kind of ends the Old Testament. But for me, I'm exactly the opposite. Every time I, I hit a hard point in my life, I'm driven to go back and I go back and I read these fellows. I read them in multiple translations. At the beginning of the pandemic, I went back to the minor prophets. I read through them in three different translations because I'm telling you, these guys could be writing our newspapers today. They're speaking to our culture. And this morning, we arrive at Micah. And Micah's this interesting book of seven chapters, and he's divided kind of right in the middle. And the first half of the book is really hard. And the second half of the book is really amazing. And the part part that we want to get to the second half doesn't mean nearly as much unless we let ourselves camp in understanding in the first half. And if we get what's said there, we begin to see the power of what he says in the second half. And I didn't think you probably would want us to read all six, seven chapters out loud today. So I picked a point that's like the hinge where it swings from this painful reality to what God is doing. This verse literally came alive to me very early on in the pandemic. I actually wrote about it because it spoke so much to me. I'm gonna read it to you out of the NIV and then I wanna read it to you out of the message translation because that's what slapped me in the face, grabbed me by the throat. This is a Micah chapter four, verse 10. Writhe in agony, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. That's the summation of half number one of the book. But listen to this. You will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hand of your enemies. Now listen to this, how Eugene Peterson handles this in the message. What you lost in Jerusalem will be found in Babylon. God will give you new life again. He'll redeem you from your enemies. What you lost in Jerusalem will be found in Babylon. That's the heart of what Micah tells us. And I want us to, I want us to dig and I want us to unpack this together this morning. Would you stand with me and let's just ask Holy Spirit who makes the word come to life to speak into our hearts. Holy Spirit, I welcome your presence that I sense in this house. You, wherever Jesus Christ is declared as Lord, you have promised to be there. Father, there's not a word I can say this morning that means anything if your touch is not on it. Holy Spirit, if your presence doesn't open our hearts, we can't even grasp the fullness of the word. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, write your word on our hearts that it might impact us, that it might change the outcome of our lives, that it might shift the atmosphere over this house. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Only in our generation would an international organization, it's called Transparency International, create something called the Corruption Perception Index. It's the average thinking of a country or a county or a city or a group of people about how bad corruption is in the culture on a scale from one to five. One, no corruption. Five, really bad. They've studied the entire cultures of the world and, and, and kind of, we would think, I think we would understand, Russia comes in with a 4.7, so does Mexico and Brazil. High sense in their countries of, of the massive corruption. But you know what the score for the U.S. is? Four out of five. That means 80% of the people in the culture believe corruption is a massive problem. And you know what they believe the most corrupt organization is? Political systems. You're just in shock, aren't you? <laughs> but you know, I thought about it and I thought, it seems like today that corruption is so rampant and widespread, so ensconced in the culture itself that we almost think it's normal. It's almost like we've grown numb to it. There's so many reports of it going on in so many arenas, we kind of shrug. But there is a corruption crisis in our day. You'll notice across from Micah is the word corruption. It's what he was speaking into in his day. Here's what I mean by the word. If you define it, corruption in its kind of most basic form is the abuse of entrusted power for personal gain. If you were to answer it on the streets, you would say it's power at a price. That's corruption. But biblically, it's even, it's even more stark. Corrupt or corruption is the exact opposite of the word purity. So the opposite of purity is corruption. Purity is something that is undiluted. It's undefiled. It's unpolluted. It's, it's uncontaminated. It's of one substance. So when he talks about us spiritually, the Bible talks about us being single-hearted or single-minded. In other words, we're unmixed. But corruption has everything to do with mixture. Something becomes corrupt as it's polluted or defiled or contaminated or tainted by some other substance. That's what James refers to when he talks about us being double-minded. In other words, we have mixed mind. And when we have a mixed mind, we're unstable in all of our ways. That's the biblical picture of corruption. And maybe the idea... And this corruption crisis that exists, maybe that's why Micah spoke so much to me and I think speaks to the culture almost more than any of these guys. It's like he's writing to us today. And it's interesting, he was in a culture like ours and gets this kind of fierce word from God. And he's just a farmer. He's literally either a farmer or a cattleman. He was a totally unlikely prophet. I mean, he had a greasy blue collar. He literally lived outside of all of the realms of governmental authority and religious power. And maybe that's why he carried such a deep burden for the marginalized and the broken and the overlooked of his culture. He actually lived right on the border of Israel. Micah could stand up and say, I can see Gath from my house. Gath was the headquarters of the Philistines. It's where Goliath and his four giant brothers were born. So he's literally living as an outsider right on the edge of the culture. And he sees the dark underbelly of Israel's decay and decline, you know, from the cheap seats. And as I look at Micah, I realize he was this outsider to the culture, looking at the brokenness of his day, and it grieved him. You can feel it. You can read it in his words. It grieved him deeply simply because he was a single-minded, single-hearted, completely devoted man of God. It's interesting. His name means one like Jehovah. It's the root for, for the name Michael, my name. 
And it, it literally means someone patterned after God. And a man who is patterned after God will be deeply grieved when he sees corruption. He will feel what the father feels when he looks at it. And the more pure hearted we become, the more instinctively we feel this as we look at the culture. I'm not talking about this kind of artificial anger that we get and we see thrown all over Facebook about the culture. I'm talking about something that literally rips at the fabric of a man's soul. Listen to his words. This is how he describes where he's at. He says, because of this, and he's talking about because of all that's going on in the culture and what it's going to bring ultimately in judgment from God. He says, because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal. I will moan like an owl. For Samaria's plague is incurable. It has spread to Judah. It has reached the very gate of, of the people, the city of Jerusalem itself. You see, a pure heart is deeply offended by corruption. You see it in Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he says to his three friends that are there with him, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death because he felt the corruption of the world. You know what you're feeling when you feel that? This is not how it's supposed to be. It's what you feel when you stand next to a hospital bed and one of your loved ones has cancer and you go, this is not how it's supposed to be. It's what you feel when you stand at the end of a little child's grave and you say, this is not how it's supposed to be. It's what you feel when you see the culture declining. You see people can't understand who they are. They don't know what gender they are. They don't know what faith they are. They literally are lost as a goose and you go, this is not how it's supposed to be. That's what Micah felt as he looked at the people of God. These were the people God had picked out, handpicked, given him his name, given him his presence. And now they're just lost as a goose. And in his heart, he just aches and wails for the people. That, my friend, is what we're supposed to feel. In fact, the whole second half of chapter one of Micah is him calling Somebody come join me in this. Mourn with me. Grieve with me over this. Stop running around as if everything is okay. Grieve with me over this. I told you this stuff was hard at first. You know, repentance is the normal response to what we see in our culture. That's the normal response. And God doesn't call the world to repent. He calls us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Do you see that? That's what Micah was doing. He was calling for the people of God to see the culture for what it was and cry out in repentance. And the first volley of the word that begins to unfold through Micah to the people is, it's hard. God says, I myself will come and break the unfaithfulness in my people. That's hard to hear. I got to thinking about this and think about all the times in the Bible that you see God described as one who's slow to anger and of great mercy, so much so that his mercies are new every morning and his faithfulness to us is great. His loving kindness and tender mercy is celebrated over and over and over again. What do you have to do to turn the heart of that God to where he has no other choice? but bring judgment. What do you have to do? Listen to Micah as he throws out the first volley from God. Hear you peoples, all of you listen, earth and all you who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple 
Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth and the mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. Micah was looking and watching the culture literally implode under the weight of its own sin. And he points directly at the cause of it. He said, all of this is verse five, chapter one. All of this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Samaria and Jerusalem were the capitals of the two parts of the broken nation. He was pointing to the power centers and said the corruption been, begins there and it's trickled down and it's covered the culture like oil in an oil slick does a, a bird of prey. The cultural decline started in Samaria and Jerusalem in the places of power. And then God says, all of this is going to bring this nation to its knees. Listen to the words coming out of our ever-loving father's mouth. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy her images. Since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, as the wages of prostitutes, they will be used again. Man, that's tough stuff. God says, I've got to come and deal with this because these are my people. They bear my name. I've set my presence down among them. And it's at this point that Micah steps up and it's like he rips a curtain open and he starts unmasking the corruption of the nation. As he looked around and his heart was broken, people of God were, were separated, they were divided. The northern kingdom was on a slip slider down to, into Syrian captivity and, and the southern kingdom of Judah was playing good king, bad king and they were up and down like a roller coaster but they were edging ever closer to a precipice. The nation was falling apart and he says, I want to tell you what I see. And as I read through Micah, I pulled out some things that seemed to be at the heart of what he would say defined the corruption of his day. I want you to listen with a mind to our culture. The first thing he talks about is the wealthy and the rulers sold out the rights of the people and gained property for themselves. Verse 2 of chapter 2. two. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. In Israel, it was a big thing that the, the land belonged to God. He stewarded it into families. And even if the family fell into hard times and lost their property, there was always at least the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, where it was coming back because the property, the land that God gave them defined them. And instead of that, the people in power were taking and they were gathering up all this property for themselves, amassing great fortunes while causing a widespread amount of homelessness and poverty. The second thing Micah talks about is that the whole country was characterized by abuse toward women and children. Verses eight and nine, lately my people have risen up like an enemy. Man, can you imagine this? God looks at his people and said, you become an enemy to me. Why? Because you strip off the rich robe of, from those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. It is an incontrovertible fact that every culture in the history of the world that has allowed the abuse of women and children all went down in flames. God will not tolerate it. Here's the next one. Business ethics were horrid in Israel at the time. Chapter three, verses one to three. Listen, you leaders of Jacob. He's describing the corporate leadership of the culture. You rulers of Israel. 
Should you not embrace justice? That's a rhetorical question that he offers to them. Guys, you know that you should embrace justice. But instead, you hate good and love evil. You tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. You eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. Man, that's ugly. But you know what it says? that the corporate culture of the day was consuming the people that worked for it. Here's the next one. Religious charlatans were making money from false prophecy. They had created an atmosphere where faith had been reduced to function with no meaning. Paul would later call it form with no power. Chapter 3, verse 5. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. You get the picture? If I get what I want, I will tell you what you want to hear. That was the religious culture of the day. And then the last one, rulers and judges were all available for a bribe. Chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. And then this is where Micah sums it up. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. So if you sum it up, Here's the corruption, my, corruption Michael was saying was, was the reason, it was the sole reason why the judgment of God was going to have to fall on the nation. Unfair financial practices, phony spiritual routines, biased political systems, and immoral leadership tactics. That sounds frighteningly familiar, doesn't it? You think Micah could be writing for the New York Times right now? And here's, here's the thing we have to remember. It wasn't just sin. God is a God of mercy and grace. He loves to forgive. He loves to redeem people who come to him and say, I blew it and I'm sorry. It wasn't sin that was his problem. It was the corruption that caused the people to devalue each other. People didn't matter anymore in the culture. And it led to these heartless relationships of inequity and prejudice. Here's the long and short of it. What brought God's hand against the people? They paid, played fast and loose with the two great commandments. Love God, love people. That stuff literally was obliterated in the culture. And as I read this stuff, and this is, I just picked out some verses to illustrate. This is rife throughout the book of Micah. As I, as I read through it, I said, what kind of a Petri dish does there have to be for this kind of corrosive corruption to grow? And here's what I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart. Corruption occurs when systems are more important than people. When making people happy is more important than telling them the truth. When maintaining status quo is more important than dealing with reality. And when building a temporal image becomes more important than building an eternal legacy. That sounds so much like our day. And I told you, the first half of this thing is really tough. And this is the point we arrive at where you want to throw up your hands and say, good God Almighty, what are we going to do? There was only one result. God, God was left literally with no choice. His solution, the divine solution to the problem is called exile. I'm going to drive you from everything you've known, everything that's identified you, everything that's made you the people of God. I'm going to drag you into a place that you've never known before. It's a place you're uncomfortable. You don't fit. Everything is wrong there. And in that place, you will recover what you lost back where you were comfortable. See, the people of God had lost everything that identified them as the people of God. They forgot who they were. And God says, I'm going to set you in a place where you will remember 
what my definition of you is. They were alienated from each other. They were estranged from everything that mattered. And God said, I've got to get you to a place where you can hear me once again. Spiritual quarantine. 70 years to think about what you'd become. Why? Here's the way God describes it. It's so powerful to me. He said, it's going to be like as you go through the 70 years, it's going to be like a woman in pregnancy that gets closer and closer. My, my wife's not here. She's with my daughter who's three weeks away from our ninth grandchild. She's about this big, a little tiny thing. Is, she, she's about to pop. That's what he said you're going to feel like and you're going to begin to feel the pains of labor, the travail of birth. And to me, this is one of the most beautiful pictures in the world. He said, I'm going to put you in a place, but there you're going to be impregnated with my spirit because I want to birth a new people out of you. You're going to feel like you're at the end of the world, but it's the beginning of your future as my people. I know from a personal level what's that, what that's like. I know what it is to arrive at a point where corruption had eaten away at my soul and the only solution God had was to crush my life as it was and put me in a place I didn't understand and put me among the people I didn't know so that I would remember, Wally, who I was. So that I would remember what he called me to do. And I sat there for 10 years, I wouldn't speak. For 10 years, I wouldn't teach a Sunday school class. For 10 years, I wouldn't even play a piano as I sat there. But during that time, Holy Spirit began to birth in me the desire again to do what I was built to do. And it was like a pregnancy. And there came a point where Diane and I said, this baby has got to be born. That's what he said to my people. I'm going to put you in that kind of an environment until I birth something new in you. This is where the whole thing shifts as Micah begins to unearth hope. I know I painted a dark picture, but we needed to see it in order to see what God was gonna do in it. Look around in the culture and I see God's people getting hopeless. I see people giving up on the culture and saying, oh, we just need to cloister away by ourselves as the people of God because, you know, it's going to hell in a handbasket all around us. But we have to be people of hope. I love Zechariah. We're going to get to him in a little while. Right in the 12th chapter, as he's talked about the same kind of things Micah talks about, he says, but return to your fortress Oh, prisoner of hope. <laughs> That's who we are. We might be prisoners, but we're prisoners of hope. We have this clean thing we can cling to that Jesus Christ is Lord over all and that the end of all things will be the beginning of all things, that there is nothing in this world that he doesn't reign over and that the cross and the resurrection have changed everything. That's who we are. We are people of hope. And Micah finds it. And as he begins to unpack it, he discovers something. God will have a people who will carry his presence and reflect his heart and demonstrate his power. He's so committed to it that he will move heaven and earth and shake hell to make it happen. We don't need to cower in the corner, guys. Because our God will have a people and they will be a people of his presence again. This is where we come to that verse I read to you. What you lost in Jerusalem, you're gonna find it in Babylon. That just blew my mind when I read it because I, I thought about them, they were in the place of God's presence. I mean, I remember when, when David and Solomon were trying to figure out how they were going to build a house for God, and God laughs at them and says, how can you build a house for me? How, what, what, what can you build that I can live in? But then he, when they build the house, 
He moves in by his presence, sets his Shekinah glory down in it, and said, I'll choose to live here among you. That's where the people of God were, but they'd lost touch with it. So he said, I'm going to take you away from that and put you in this thing called the exile. Last night I was driving to church and I remembered something I'd read from one of my favorite theologians, Jürgen Moltmann. And he said in the Jewish tradition, the Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as the spirit of exile. And the picture is that when God picked up his people and he deposited them in Assyria and Babylon separated from their land, that he ripped out a piece of himself and he placed it inside of them so they would never forget where they belonged. And the whole time they lived in exile, there was an ache in their soul, so much so that the psalmist wrote it like this, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I ever forget you, O Jerusalem. They hung their harps on willows because they couldn't sing the songs of joy because they weren't home. But that Holy Spirit in them grew and grew and grew. And the Shekinah reminded them and they rediscovered who they were and they had the ache for home until they finally were brought back after 70 years. I've always thought, what was it like when the first people walked back into the rubbles of the city and had been decimated and destroyed but they looked at each other and said we're home this is where we belong this is where we belong what did they lose that they found first they lost their identity they forgot who they were they no longer understood what it meant to be the people of God they, they lost their destiny. God said, I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to choose you and raise you up as a people that will bless the entire earth. They completely forgot their purpose and vision. But the thing they forgot most was their intimacy. They lost touch with the fact that God wanted to be so close to them that he moved into the neighborhood. They lost the sense and the understanding that he wanted to be with them. And he said, I'm gonna take you from there to there. And there you will remember who you were. You will remember what you are here for. And you will remember what it's like to be in my presence. And you'll move everything to get back there. The major truth of this minor prophet is this. The darkness of the culture is the perfect backdrop against which the people of God can shine brightest. Put me in the darkest place because I want to shine. Turn out the lights around me. I want to shine. I want people to see the light of God. I've actually had people tell me, don't you get tired of telling your story? It's hard, it's dark, it's got bad chapters in it. Huh. I'll, ne I'll never get tired of telling that story of how he took me from there back to who I was, who he'd made me to be. I'll never get tired of telling that story. And you shouldn't either. He said, I'm going to take you back. And this is the first thing God promises them. Remember, this is a promise before they go into exile. He said, when you come back from there, and I'm going to bring you back, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. You notice the first thing he promises? I'm going to put my presence back because you are people of my presence primarily and above everything else, we are people of the presence of God. In fact, God told Moses, this is the thing that will distinguish you from all the other peoples on the earth. My presence will be among you. Oh, let us never, ever, ever get used to being distanced from the presence of God. And in that presence, here's what he prophesies. This is in chapter four. He says, in that presence, will live purity. I love this. He said, God will teach you 
and you will obey him. God himself will teach you and you'll walk in his ways. And in that place will be peace, not because you've acquiesced to the culture, but because you beat your, your, your farm implements into weapons and you went out and won the war and now you've established the reign and the shalom of God. And in that place will be provision there won't be any more us and them. There won't be any more 1%. Every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree. And in that place of my presence, there'll be purpose. I love verse five. He says, all these other nations, they walk in the name of their false gods, but you, you will walk wearing the name of the Lord, your God. God will have a people who accurately represent him in the earth, represent him to the earth. I love the way he goes on to say, this is verse six in chapter four. In that day, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles and those I have brought to grief. And I will make the lame my remnant. Those driven away, a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day forward. I love that. He said, I want a people so bad, I will dig in the ashes to get them. And I'll make the lame my people. And the people that have been broken, they're going to be a strong nation. Where, where is that kind of shalom going to be found? In Babylon. You know, I love to worship. I think you probably know that by now, but I love to worship. Come in here, Mike, Kristen, lead us in worship. I just get lost in that stuff. But did you know his presence is just as real in exile? That's where they were gonna find him. You're gonna be as far from Jerusalem and the temple and the songs of the Lord as you can be, but you're gonna find me there. And if you find me there, you can carry me anywhere. And I love this part. This is verse 12. I love it when I got to this. I, I literally was in my house screaming when I got to this part. Because God says, the fact of the matter is when I do this thing and I take you over here, nobody's gonna get it. Nobody is gonna get this. Nobody's gonna understand. You won't even understand. And listen to how he says it. This is the message translation. These blasphemers, that's the nations around Israel, have no idea what God is thinking and doing in this. They don't know that this is the making of God's people. Think about that. He said, around all of the nations, look and they see me come down and cart you off into exile and they think I've forsaken you. They don't have a clue what God is doing in all of this because right there in that place is the making of God's people. I, I, I thought about that for church. In this pandemic, we got scattered. We couldn't meet in the building anymore. I, I have a lot of pastor friends and I, I can't tell you how much it breaks a pastor's heart when he can't see his flock. It's devastating to them. It, you know, God blessed and many churches did well financially during that. People were faithful, but he couldn't get his hands on his sheep. And it's hard on them. And the enemy and even the world looked at it and said, the church will never recover from this. You'll never see numbers like that again. They'll get used to not being in the building. But they didn't know what God was doing in this. Because when we got scattered and we couldn't gather, you know what the enemy is called by Paul? The prince and the power of the air. You know what the church did when it couldn't get together in a building anymore? We went into his space. We went into the air. Even little tiny churches start broadcasting their services over Facebook and all these other vehicles. And all of a sudden, we were all up in his face. And he thought he had won. But it's like we knocked on his door and said, excuse us, we're going to borrow the airwaves here for a little while. I don't know if it happened to you, but I watched more church in the last year and a half than I have in my life. I've seen all kinds of different people. And I get so excited because you see them across stripes and across creeds. And they're all declaring across the air, Jesus Christ is Lord in this. The enemy had no idea what he was doing, but in this is the making of God's people. So the reality is what happened there 
was that the people became more authentically the people of God in Babylon than they'd ever been in Jerusalem. And God said, I'm going to bring you back. Once that work is done, once that baby gets born, I'm going to bring you back. And he, look how he describes him. He says, when you come back, you're going to be two things. You're going to be a warrior and you're going to be a worshiper. He said, you're going to be a warrior. He said, I'm remaking you into a people invincible. Man, I love that. But then he says, on your way back, you're going to fight some battles and you're going to win some things and you're going to get all kinds of bounty and you're going to bring it and you're going to offer it in my temple as offerings to me. When we just rediscover who we are, we become dangerous to the kingdom of darkness and precious to the kingdom of God. And here's where it ends. This is where we're going to wrap it up. Chapter 5 introduces the greatest prophecy of Micah's writing. He says, I'm going to bring this people back. They're going to be restored. They're going to be made whole. And out of them will come a Savior who will save the whole world. Micah 5, 3, but you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. See the prophecy? That's the one that was offered to Herod as an explanation to where he could find Jesus. Micah was saying, when the people of God step into all that they're made to be. Jesus is revealed in a way that's undeniable in the world. Listen to as he goes on. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. And then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. Against the darkness, the light will shine to the ends of the earth. And I love this. He will be our peace. Jehovah Shalom. He will be our peace. Micah wraps the whole thing up by saying, when all of this happens and, and this, you've been made a birthing place for the Savior to invade the earth. When all of this happens, you're going to get back to the simplicity of it all. Probably his most famous words. He has shown you O oh, mortal, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? To act justly. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. That's what they were like when they found in Babylon what they'd lost in Jerusalem. That's what we're like when we go through the broken spaces in the critical places of life and we discover that he is still king and Lord and good and God in those moments, we come out with that same heart. Here's how Paul sums it up, Philippians chapter two. This is the message again. Go out into the world uncorrupted. That's his command to us. This is your, this is your homework this week, church. Go out into the world uncorrupted. A breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and the living God. Carry the light giving message into the night. Wally will remember this back in probably the uh, 90s, Wally. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. 
send forth your word. That, Lord, and let there be light. That's, that's what Micah's saying. His message is one of the greatest messages of hope we can have in our culture. God wins. Father, we thank you that in the midst of the darkness, you sent light. In him was life and life was the light of the world. And you, Jesus, the light of the world told us we would be light in this world. And God, it's dark. You know that. So we pray, shine, Jesus, shine. I pray that this week we would have an opportunity in the black background of our culture to be bright, glowing lights. In a crooked and perverse generation, shining as lights in the world. I pray against hopelessness despair that's gripping some hearts. May we be prisoners of hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me. Have I not told you what I am doing in the earth today? Have I not pulled back the curtain so that you can see my purposes in the earth? Have I not turned on the light switch so that the light will shine in your hearts and in your minds, so that you understand my word and see that my word has already put down for you in black and white what I'm doing in the earth in this day at this time. Do you see darkness all around you? Do you see corruption in every corner? Do you see hearts doing evil? Do you see bad things happening everywhere? Yes, you do. But do you not also see that I am in the earth, that my spirit is moving upon the waters of the people, that my presence is everywhere around this globe, and I have not stopped, I have not hidden myself, I am not hiding in a corner, mm. but I am in the earth, yes. and I am in this place, and I am in your heart. And I, my spirit is in you, and I love you, and I love so many in this earth. And my spirit is moving in them. And my spirit is, in, is moving in every nation. And my spirit is moving in this nation. I have pulled back the curtain for you, and I am showing you what I am doing in the earth. Do I not tell my people who listen to my name, who listen to my voice, who listen to my spirit, have I not told them what mm. I am doing and will do mm. in the earth? So do not despair, my people, if you see evil at every corner of the compass. Do not despair, for I am still among you. I am still with you. And I will still fulfill my purpose. It is not over. It is just beginning to be. Mm way that the nations and leaders of the world do not comprehend. Wow. You comprehend. Wow. And you heard today unfolded from Micah. Mm. Stay with me two minutes, church. If you don't understand that, if you've never been a part of that, it's called a word of prophecy. That's a response from God, an immediately intelligible response from God to us about his plan and his purpose. You're standing in a, in a live sense of his presence right now. So I'm gonna ask you to do something before we walk out these doors. In response to that word, if you feel comfortable doing, even if you don't feel comfortable doing so, would you hold your hands out in a receiving position? And would you just genuinely ask the Lord, make me a light in my culture, in my day, in my time. Make me a light in my city, in my family. Father, we, we thank you for your response to your word and to our worship. And we ask you, oh Father, give us hearts that are broken like Micah's for our culture, but fill them with the hope to believe we are light in the darkness. We carry presence in the vacuum of our culture 
and that what people need more than anything in the world is Jesus. God, help us this week to be lights in darkness, to be lights in darkness. We respond to your response to us, and we say to you, yes, Lord, yes, and amen. We will. We will. Amen. Well, I was going to pronounce a blessing over you, but I think God already took care of that. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. May the Lord light you up this week. Amen. God bless you. Wow.